Um, so now I am really delighted. This is one of my favorite parts of this annual symposium is to present the Edge and Tech Athena Awards. To introduce and MC the awards, please welcome Citrus Director Costas Panos. I'll turn it over to Costas. Thanks. Thank you, Camille, and welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, the Edge and Tech Athena Awards recognize those who embody, encourage, and promote the inclusion of women and people of color in technology. We started these awards in 2016 to highlight the work of leaders who inspire others to pursue and persist in technical careers. Their outstanding contributions, service, and mentorship foster inclusion in science and technical fields. They demonstrate the impact individuals can have and the agency opportunity which have to play uh, in a role in promoting equity. Uh, myself, I had the privilege of advising some amazing students, and both graduate and undergraduate, as they were starting their research journey here at Berkeley. I'm um, now in my fourth decade in my career, and that's a fact that is still shocking to me, but it gives me a true long-term view, and it is the greatest pleasure to see those students grow and do amazing things in their own careers. Many of those students in my group over the years were women, and some were people of color, even in these early years. And it is wonderful to see how they thrived and became amazing leaders and role models when given an opportunity to do so. I'm still in touch with most of them, and it is this personal experience that I bring when I, it comes to pursuing these initiatives with Citrus, and especially the Edge in Tech Athena Awards. As in previous years, this year's awardees were chosen from a competitive national pool of individuals and organizations exemplify pathways and support for underrepresented minorities in tech. As you will see, the work in equity and STEM education is inspiring. We have four categories and uh, we'll award uh, these awards in these four categories, executive leadership, academic leadership, early career, and next generation engagement. As in prior years, uh, our own Dan Sapman from our Citrus Invention Lab has designed this year's awards, as you can see on the screen. Its award will be presented to the exceptional awardees by an individual who wants to share why they are so worthy of recognition and who have had the opportunity to see these award winners in action. So to get us started, to present our first award for executive leadership, please welcome Rani Borkar, Corporate Vice President, Azure at Microsoft. Thank you so much, Costas. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, real um, honor to be here with you all today. My name is Rani Borker, and um, I'm the Corporate Vice President of Azure Hardware Systems and Infrastructure at Microsoft. And in that uh, capacity, I lead the core teams that are building the platform for the Microsoft Cloud uh, from silicon to systems and supply chain. And uh, it's my great pleasure to present the Athena Award for Executive Leadership uh, to my dear friend and someone I have known for many years and look up, looked up to, uh, Jody Shelton. Uh, she's the CEO of the Global Semiconductor Alliance, um, in short, GSA. This award recognizes outstanding efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in technology. Um, and Jody and the GSA Women's Leadership Initiative embody just that. As a member of the board myself for the GSA and on GSA's Women Leadership Council, I have seen firsthand the impact of Jody's steadfast commitment to making the technology industry more diverse, um, equitable, and inclusive. And anyone in our industry <clears throat> who has even spent five minutes with Jody has been moved hearing her vision. So just allow me to share, you know, where I have seen Jody's impact make a difference. First and foremost, um, Jody is a visionary. Uh, and I hope, you, you know, those of you, as I said, you know, know her, know this about her. The semiconductor industry, as um, um, Sujay and others were discussing, really requires a highly talented and educated workforce to build a hardware that fuels future innovation. Jody is one of the key figures that's driving progress to ensure that the next wave of technological innovations can truly reap the benefits of more diverse perspectives um, and points of view. Now, Jodi is not just talk, um, she actually executes, you know, and I love Jodi for that. Uh, with her leadership and advocacy, the WLI has inspired and empowered others to take steps to address the recruitment, retention, and career advancement of women in technology. 
through programs, events, resources. Uh, the WLI continues to set the standard for companies to follow, and Jodi works tirelessly to promote gender parity in leadership. And last but not the least, Jodi builds communities. Over just the past few years, she's built an incredibly tight knit and robust community, both within the GSA and our Women's Leadership Initiative. She fundamentally understands that systematic change can only happen when an entire community is moving in the same direction. <clears throat> So without further ado, I'm thrilled, I'm delighted to present the Athena Award to Jodi Shelton. Congratulations, Jodi. So, so proud of you. And thank you for everything you do, Jodi. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rani and uh, Jodi. Congratulations. I think uh, you, uh, I don't know if you were gonna make any remarks, Jodi. Yes, yes, thank you. So I'm I'm truly honored to receive the Athena Award and to have my life's work recognized. And I'm really touched by Ronnie's comments as she's one of the really true heroes of our industry and a role model for me personally. So I've had an amazing career as an advocate of the most revolutionary and innovative industry in the world, the semiconductor industry. And to still be having fun and still be shaking it up and to receive recognition like this is really very meaningful. In my career, I've had the privilege of spending the time, my time and company of brilliant technologists, business mavericks, and world-altering innovators, people like Jensen Wong and Morris Chang and Lisa Su. And much of the time, you could imagine that I felt completely unqualified, maybe most people would in the company of these leaders. But somehow I never let that stop me. And I started the Global Semiconductor Alliance at GSA when I was in my 20s which was just young enough to think I knew more than I did and naive enough to think that I could do anything. But really, even in my wildest dreams, I would never have expected the success uh, that the GSA has today. The GSA is the global voice for the semiconductor industry, all of the critical supply chain partners, as well as the extended ecosystem, including customers. So we're out there promoting global collaboration and the idea of sharing the innovation burden in the world of tech, we know that technical women in general and it specifically in leadership are grossly underrepresented. And in the semiconductor industry, it's even magnified in part because of the requirements for backgrounds in areas such as material science or physics or electrical engineering, which attracts even less young women than areas such as software and computer science, although we need you too. But what we really did, we really want to change this and, and really have put together some programs to do that. So a few years ago, I was at a GSA dinner and someone pointed out to me that I was the only woman at the dinner. And I had become accustomed to not, if not being the only woman, at least being one of only a few. And maybe I had even grown to accept this. So that night I had a real epiphany. And in short order, I sought to change this accepted norm. And the first step was to recognize impactful women in our industry, much like the Athena Awards is doing today. So the GSA created the Rising Women of Influence Award. And when we received the dozens of nominations, what we discovered was sadly shocking. I didn't know any of these women. I didn't even know their names. And yet their achievements were critical to our industry. And the interesting thing also was that these women didn't know each other. So although we have too few women in our industry, the women that we do have are profoundly talented. And we have now created a platform to make sure that women like this are spotlighted and that they that we know them, that the world knows them. So when the GSA launched the Women's Leadership Initiative, we had three primary goals. One was to attract more STEM-focused university women to our industry. Secondly, to retain, develop, and promote the women that were in the industry. And third, to support female entrepreneurs. The initiative has grown and it, we have dozens of programs from university programs to mentorship programs to support women in all phases of their career. And we have developed the first of its kind technical conference called WISH, Women in Semiconductor Hardware. It's a great event um, bringing together global female leaders, entrepreneurs and university women to share their love of hardware and to showcase the changing face of semiconductors and celebrate the women who've helped break the glass ceiling and those that follow in their footsteps. Our industry understands 
that if we want to achieve a trillion dollars in revenue, which is the goal for 2000 by 2030, then we have to increase the talent pipeline. And therefore we must attract and support women and underrepresented minorities if we're going to achieve this. If you're a young woman evaluating your career opportunities, I would say this, there has never been a better time to be in the semiconductor industry and the industry wants and needs you. There are daunting problems facing our society that can and likely will be solved through technology. And you can be part of designing the solution. The industry has created some great engineers, but we've also created great human beings. So we hope that you will join the industry and use your unique talent and your voice to make your companies and your teams more productive, the environment more conducive, and the world more inclusive. So my career has been a big, a huge surprise, and it happened in large part because I was willing to take risks and I didn't let anyone define me. So I would urge you today to take risks early and make it a way of life. And to quote the great Dr. Lisa Sue, be brave and run towards the hardest problems. Again, thank you for this recognition. Thank you so much and congratulations, Jody. Uh, the semiconductor industry being my own professional home for all these decades, I find your, your remarks spot on and extremely inspiring. So thank you. So thank next you. up, please welcome to the stage, Professor and Founding Director of the Center for Blockchain Law for Social Good, Michelle Nitz, to present the award for academic leadership. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I think this conference is a really exciting annual event. Um, and I'm so pleased to see the great turnout. Uh, my job today is to present the and introduce the winner of the Athena Award for Academic Leadership, Professor Tanya Evans. Um, this award is meant to honor someone who has under who is undertaking technically innovative work, demonstrating leadership in their field and and also mentoring students and postdocs and junior faculty and young women professionals. Um, I don't actually, and I've been given three minutes, I don't have time to tell you all the ways that Professor Evans is doing this, um, but I will tell you a bit about why I'm so excited that she won this award. Um, in addition to being a tenured full professor at Penn State Dickinson Law School, she also has a, a co-hire appointment to the Penn State Institute for Computational and Data Sciences. And this immediately sets her apart from most law professors who tend to run from computer science instead of toward it. Um, she yeah. also, in addition, uh, her work is her research work is interdisciplinary, focusing on legal and regulatory and policy implications around new technologies and innovation, with a particular focus on uh, the emerging technology space of blockchain and Web3. Um, Dr. Evans was named to be the, in the very prestigious 50 over 50 Forbes list in the category of investment. She has also done um, legislative advising and is helping the state of Pennsylvania to determine its approach to blockchain regulation. But none of this is why I nominated her for this award. Uh, I actually nominated Professor Evans because of the way she is educating populations about crypto, blockchain, and new technologies. Um, she actually is using pop culture methods that most law professors, again, would run from instead of towards. Um, that includes her popular podcast, Tech Intersect, her crypto education classes that are geared toward non-lawyers. She is prolific on social media and reaches a lot of exciting audiences as a result. Um, and frankly, her focus is really in alignment with what the Edge in Tech Symposium is all about, which is opening opportunity for those who may not feel that the tech, tech space is welcoming to them. So she promotes inclusion and, and equity within law schools and universities, but she's also doing this in the larger world and she's blending together law and technology in a way that frankly, no one else has done before her or is doing right now. Um, and she's also just an, an incredibly warm person. And so I'm so delighted uh, to present this award to Dr. Evans um, and congratulations. 
Thank you so much. Um, it's so touching. I almost didn't turn on my 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 camera. I was like, oh, this is lovely. It's like, oh, oh, I must turn on my camera now. It's a wonderful to see you. Hello, and thank you so very much, Professor Neitz and Edge in Tech Initiative at Berkeley, Citrus and Berkeley Engineering for this incredibly high honor in being nominated and certainly selected to receive the Edge in Tech Athena Award for Academic Leadership at the intersections of blockchain, crypto assets, and the law. And also for important and impactful recognition of women and members of Black and Indigenous populations in technology at every level of career and impact and leadership. And also for your consistent commitment to amplify the excellence of all winners this year and those of the trailblazers and activators who've come before. Please look at the list, it's exceptional. Because by your work, you remind some, uh, but inform others that we don't exactly have a pipeline problem. The challenge is in ensuring legacy leaders proactively boost the signal of our presence, our impact, our success, our leadership in technology and the acknowledgement and the acceptance of the fact that when women and communities of color are not just invited to be in the room where it happens, nod to Hamilton or sitting close to the table where decisions are made, but actively leading, informing the decisions and indeed making the decisions for what the future of work and wealth and creativity in Web3 and beyond will look like because the bottom line is that the bottom line is better in dollars, in Bitcoin, and the world is certainly better, always better when we are all included. And so it's imperative as leaders in advocacy, representation and problem solving, um, the way the, the lead, to lead, excuse me, the way to an equitable and inclusive future so that the blockchain ecosystem and Web3 more broadly is as good as it's promised. And that's because inclusion in academic leadership and innovation isn't just a nice to have, although it is, and not just beneficial, although it certainly is. It's essential. And it's essential to ensure that under the guise of, of merely building technologically agnostic tools that make things better, faster, and cheaper, that we're not actually replicating the same systemic ills, inefficiencies, externalities, and asymmetries in access and inclusion in this fast paced tech-centered, globally interconnected world. And to that end, and in sum, I believe that the writing is on the wall for higher education, evolve or die. A recent Cointelegraph article reported that crypto and blockchain education becomes priority at top university. It should be a top priority at every college and university and graduate program. That takes resources, yes, but it also requires vision, especially when we're building the plane, quite frankly, while flying it. My most popular elective in, since 2018, blockchain, crypto, and law. Even short form or remote or virtual courses can have a huge impact on a student's confidence and skill set for a competitive advantage in a job search. That was the impetus for when I created and directed the very first comprehensive blockchain, crypto, and law online certificate program. It's the reason I've written a new book. Digital Money Demystified to empower um, investors, consumers, builders, and leaders uh, to separate Web3 fact from fiction. And it's the reason that educators have to keep pace with the needs and demands of the new collar professional skills in an increasingly decentralized workforce. And how to prepare responsibly and effectively the next wave of lawyers and leaders, entrepreneurs of every gender and hue, orientation, and ethnicity for the future because the future is now and it depends on us. So thank you again for this incredible honor. I look forward to continuing to build a more accessible and inclusive world through the power and the promise of technology and tech leaders and educators like those honored by Edge in Tech this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tonya. Very inspiring remarks and we'll all uh, strive to evolve as, as, as you remarked. And thank you, Mich Michelle. To present the Early Career Award is uh, Beth Pruitt, Director, Center for Bioengineering at UC Santa Barbara. Beth has pre-recorded her remarks, so let's listen. Hi, I'm Beth Pruitt from University of California in Santa Barbara. 
And I'm here to introduce Erica Moore, today's award winner and honoree. I first came to know Erica through our community in the bioengineering and biomaterials field, so at various conferences. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about her impact of her work um, and her interests in her research field. But the reason that I nominated her for the award was really what I came to know about Erica and her efforts in the community through an extended organization that we both participated in called BMU Unite which is a, a strong network across the country of faculty in bioengineering who are similarly interested in promoting and advocating for um, best practices for equitable and inclusive practices and policies for recruitment, for mentorship, for funding, uh, for professional development, and support for increasing and supporting diversity in, in academia, in bioengineering, in industry, and for our students, our faculty, our staff. And I, I learned through this um, interactions with Erica about an organization that she set up called More Wealth during her own PhD. And so she realized, you know, she said she was fortunate to learn from others who reached out and told her about going to graduate school and continuing one's education and the type of support that's available. And she realized, you know, that it was possible for her and she was passionate and interested in it. And having that conversation really changed her path. And so she set up this organization to provide that kind of counseling, coaching and advocacy um, on financial liter literacy to students who may not um, have access to the types of mentors or that conversation that, that steers you to opportunities you might not otherwise know about. And I was just so impressed by the fact that she set this up you know, even as a graduate student to help others and to create these scholarships, to create these programs for financial literacy um, with another colleague, uh, Lola and Ilo Adifeso. Uh, they've also recently established something called the Engage Fellowship, which helps to, uh, to create some financial bootstrapping for students from underrepresented groups and backgrounds who are going to graduate school. Because even if you do learn that you can pay for graduate, get that graduate school paid for, um, it's still, you know, it's it's still a burden uh, for a lot of students and to have that additional funding to make that possible. So anyways, I applaud you, Erica, and I, I'm so happy, you know, to be your colleague, to, ha to have you as a friend and and to see you honored by this award. You you definitely deserve it. And for those of you who don't know about Erica Moore and her her efforts and her advocacy and her research, I encourage you to check out her website. It has links to all of these activities. She's at the University of Florida. And uh, she also has a very strong statement of, of values and what we could be doing to improve the community. So thank you, Eric, and congratulations. Indeed, uh, very nice remarks so by Hi, Beth. Congratulations, uh, and please welcome Erica Moore. Erica. Thank you all so much. I, I wanna start by thanking Beth and the organizers of Edge and Tech for this mission and the celebration of women who are basically trailblazing um, in different spaces. So we heard from other speakers earlier, and I am so humbled and honored to see, you know, the basically in the room where it happens, as Dr. Evans just said. Um, and so I actually, because I'm an early career awardee, I thought it would be really helpful to share, you know, my have my remarks kind of be framed in lessons that I have learned. And so this is my intent today. I'm going to share some of my slides and it will not last long. So I'm not going to be long winded. Um, I just thought it would be helpful for people to kind of understand what I've experienced and how I came to um, shape, you know, what I, the efforts that I do. So I, I'm sharing this as lessons in failure because I don't really believe that failure exists. It's just feedback, you know? And so that framing, I think could help inspire those in the audience, all of us here today um, to continue our efforts in diversifying our, our respective fields and, and hopefully also the world. Um, and so some of the lessons that shaped me or also continue to shape me um, as I've grown in confidence are recognizing my why, recognizing the priority, creating community, and trying to be as fearless as possible. Um, and so the first you know, element or way that I, I tried to recognize my why was basically trying to figure out, well, what do I care about? As Beth alluded to, I really thought it was a travesty that students who are from financially insecure backgrounds 
do not receive the same privileges when we start in higher education. And so this became a massive why for me. In fact, the reason why I created the nonprofit More Wealth is because my sister dared me to do it. You know, she was like, well, I'm tired of listening to you complain. Why don't you go do something about it? And that's when I was able to kind of leverage the resources around me, family and friends with positive reinforcements to basically recognize what I was most passionate about and try to work towards addressing that passion. The other thing that I did is recognizing the priority. So I think there are so many different ways that we can enact or implement change within our respective societies and fields. Um, but it's also really important to be insistent or conservative with your effort. And that by that, I mean, you can have, you know, a really wide effort in a multiple uh, range of different ways, or you can have a more directed effort that maybe penetrate, sorry, penetrates deeper, you know. And so I tried to set a priority and someone might call this ruthless, prior to, ruthless prioritization, where you basically kind of understand, I have a limited resource myself, time, money, whatever it might be, but I've got to make, I want to make an impact. So how can I do that, right? Being aware of distractions and asking advisors, some of the people in the audience today for feedback. If I want to change this field, what can I do to have the broadest impact, you know, with the resources that I have? So recognizing that priority. And then, um, I also love the quote. Some of the other audience members have talked about kind of this idea that, if you can overcome the notion um, that you are that you must be regular, it robs you of the chance to be extraordinary. And this is a quote by Uta Hagen. And I love what this quote embodies because it's the idea that if we can master our mindset, we can master the world. And so it's really mind above matter in this regard for implementing and changing some of the elements that we wanna see or change in our environments respectively. And then last but not least, I hope that everyone in the audience today remembers to be fearless. Um, I love asking myself the question, what would I do if I knew I could never fail, right? Because failure is not terminal, it's just feedback. Um, and so I want to encourage people to think in ways that you want to implement and change the world. You can trust in yourself to understand that you've got this. You can be courageous and then you can find your accelerators. For example, all of the speakers here today are accelerators, right? And sources of inspiration and they can make your heart beat faster in terms of helping you identify passions and then work towards those goals. So with that, I will stop sharing. And I just wanted to, again, thank the organizers for this opportunity. Hopefully those short pieces of advice can inspire everyone in the audience who's maybe looking up in aspiration you know, to take their own path and to implement change in the world for the betterment of all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Wonderful to hear your story and advice. I, I, I really like your remark. Failure is feedback. And I was reflecting on how much valuable feedback I have had in my own career. So thank you for that. So our final award is for Next Generation Engagement. This award was to be presented by Executive Vice President from ADECO, Mary Louise, but there are some traffic challenges today, so we are excited to welcome a data scientist alumna of CalNerds, who is going to, the intro, to do the introduction on Mary's behalf. Please welcome Carla Castellanos. Carla? Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Carla Palos Castellanos. I'm a research associate at the California Policy Lab, merging my love for data and public policy. As you mentioned, I'm a UC Berkeley alumna. But more importantly, I'm a CalNerds alumna. And it is with great pleasure that I get to be here with you today to share a little bit more about this organization. The CalNerds program is a suite of programs and initiatives that provide faculty mentor research opportunities, a specialized tech training, graduate school preparation, career coaching, community building, and professional development for high achieving STEM undergraduate and graduate students from many non-dominant backgrounds. But today I wanna talk a little bit more about my experience with this program. It was very transformative in different ways. As a student, CalNerds showed up for me. When I was in the verge of dropping out, CalNerds provided me guidance and holistic support. When I didn't feel like I belong, CalNerds provided me with a home at our center. When I didn't know how to get started with research or what an internship even was, CalNerds helped me land an internship and many research opportunities. When I didn't know what was out there for me, what I could do, what someone like me could actually achieve, uh, CalNerds provided me with travel grants to conferences. They helped me find mentorship and much more. As a student director working for CalNerds, 
Connor showed up for me by helping me develop my, my leadership skills and allowing me to teach Python, uh, intro to Python workshops uh, to students across the country, in addition to letting me teach intro to data science workshops, which is actually how I came into this program. They also helped me follow my passion for food justice and entrusted me to lead efforts by helping individuals sign up for food assistance programs. We also launched a uh, Wednesday speaker series where we provided a warm meal for students during professional development workshops. And we also created a food pantry where we were able to provide students with more than just food, but also many other basic needs. And you know, the list goes on and on, and I could talk about Cal Nerds for days, um, but I think with this, I'll pass it to our Cal Nerds uh, director, Diana, who makes all of this um, magic happen. Thank you, Carla. Thank you so much. My name is Diana Lusaraga, and I'm an educational technologist. Um, I've been working in higher ed since 1995. I taught myself how to code, gosh, must have been 1996, in a landscape of programmers. And um, it really helped me pay for college. I had five jobs. I've been at Cal for 20 years, uh, which means that I'm a professional problem solver. And I'm finishing up my doctorate and my research is in techno inclusion. Um, I wanted to say thank you to the Athena Awards for allowing us to have this award. I wanted to say thank you to our nominators as well and to our other um, awardees. I was asked to share, what is it about Cal Nerds? What is it you do? And Carla is just one wonderful example of many of the work that we do. I'm gonna share screens and share a little bit more about our program so you can see. Uh, so Cal Nerds, Nerd stands for New Experiences for Research and Diversity in Science. And it's something that the students came up with to go through and have a name that was unifying. So as they went through and did that, we started to have more and more student directors helping us. So the work that I'm going to share with you very briefly is not only a reflection of my passion for diversity STEM and especially technology, but also the excitement that I have in working with students and lifting up their ideas and their thoughts on how we shape spaces. So this is a, a snapshot of our current team of Cal Nerd Scholars. Um, we have Chris Noble, who's our assistant director, wonderful person. We also get the support of campus and UC leaders, faculty, partners, mentors, um, and you know Mary Ruiz, who unfortunately is in Europe and uh, got into a traffic um, situation wasn't able to join us, but everybody in this kind of collective solar system um, of nerdy happiness made this possible. So let me share a teeny bit about what we do and how we do it. So first of all, um, it's really important for uh, students from non-dominant backgrounds to have a home away from home when they're on you know, a campus. And so that's one of the things that Cal Nerds provides. We're very fortunate to actually have a student center a physical space where students can come in, they can print their research posters, they can study. Carla mentioned we have a food pantry in here. This is a picture of our food pantry at 9 p.m. at night on a Friday. So you might think that studying is done, but a lot of nerds are getting their nerd on and studying. And so we provide them with seaweed, granola bars, um, scantrons, note pages, just things that they can use to be successful. Um, another thing about our program is that we do outreach. And so that is a really important element of the work that we do. For example, last month we went to, or I guess that would be now that we're in March, in January, we went to a high school and talked to their clubs and talked to them about coding and what it's like to be at Cal, how to envision themselves there. So part of that is that exposure, participation and transformation. It's important that those of us that are in this space really get a chance to expose younger students or other uh, students to the thought that it is possible that they could be not only an amazing, talented student, but they can be innovative and create things that are gonna help improve um, the human condition. So we like to do outreach excited to be working not only with our own Berkeley students, but across the country, especially um, with some of the efforts that Carla had mentioned related to Python. Um, it's also important when you're a program to think about the intentionality of having a framework. So this is one example of the framework that we use, techno inclusion, and it allows us to use equity and inclusion practices via technology to create a sense of belonging, validating experiences, a positive organizational culture, or campus climate, as we would say at Cal, 
that connects in this particular situation, students to activities, opportunities, information, and networks. It's not for us to say, you need to do this. It's for us to create these buffets of possibility and opportunities and to invite our students to explore what that looks like for them. So techno inclusion is something that we try to practice and, and really be intentional because we not only support work in person, but also digitally. Um, Carla had mentioned Python. She was one of our students who actually was in our Intro to Data Science Steminist boot camp. So we were the ones that really gave her some exposure on how to code. And now she's able to lead those workshops along with some other wonderful students. So the focus on computational skill building is really important because not everybody is a computer scientist. And so if you're um, economics or if you're biology or if you're physics, how might you use Python in your world to pivot into new opportunities? So specifically, the workshops that we create are workshops designed for students that have no coding experience at all. We focus on college students and grad students. Um, and that is really important work that we do. We primarily focus on Python, but we have done R. We've had guest um, instructors who have taught web dev, um, and we've also done data science. So that work I really value, and it's because when I was teaching myself how to code, I didn't have a boot camp. So I really wanted to create a weekend boot camp that could offer students exposure. Another thing we do is we provide advising and grants. We do a lot of techno advising via you know, cell phone, via Zoom, but also in person. And we provide grants for things that maybe people don't think about. Um, for example, we took 50 students, this is a picture here of our students to Puerto Rico for the SACNAS National Diversity STEM Conference. And we knew it was important to actually buy 36 pieces of luggage to raffle off and to give that to students um, because that was a hidden curriculum barrier that they were facing. Um, and so it's important for us to meet them where they're at. And um, luckily we had our Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, Danya Matos, who was kind enough to hear about the story about the luggage and offered to help pay for that. So we're very fortunate to have these grants from our donors, from opportunities to partner, and these have really important impacts to our students, from the food that we have to professional clothes that they get a chance to wear because they got a professional clothes grant, or a conference that they get to attend because they have funding now to go. We also have launched a new techno-inclusive web tool called STAR, and this provides a STEM landscaping of our UC Berkeley campus which we really appreciate the fact that we have have it out there now and students can download it, parents can look at it, and we're getting ready to launch our faculty engagement opportunity tool in a few weeks here. So those are just some of the things that NERDS does. We really appreciate all of the student support, all of the community support, all of our partnering support. Thank you to Mary and thank you to the group for allowing us to have a chance to share the work that we do. So thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, it was really great to hear about Cal Nerds and the work that you've done, your commitment to the organization is really inspiring. Um, there was one question in the Q&A about the dates for the boot camp. I wonder if you wanted to give either a, a website or to offer details like that. Sure. So our next boot camp for college and grad students is scheduled for uh, the second week in March, and we go from 10 to 1 are put on the chat, our NERDS website, or maybe Carla, I could ask you to put it in. So it's basically nerds.berkeley.edu is Great. our website. It's up on the screen as well. Um, feel free to join. We love having community college students. Uh, we love having students from all over the country get exposure to this. It's created by us for students, run by students, and we make every um, every possibility that we can to encourage questions and have space to answer those questions. So yeah. yeah, thank you. I really love the story about offering the support for this luggage and for the clothing, you know, like those are the hidden barriers um, that if we can identify them and address them, then um, it seems like something quite minimal in some ways, but it can really have a huge impact. So thank you for that, for that insight and creativity in your program. So congratulations to everyone. Thank you, Costas, for hosting the Athena Award presentation so ably and for your support for the program for the last many years. Really appreciate your partnership on that. Um, and again, a special shout out to our senior artist, Dan Chapman, for creating the wonderful custom wooden artifacts that each of the award winners will receive.